Well, an associate pastor was, was running errands and had to put in the order for the church's Christmas sign. And uh, so he went to the shop, but realized that he had forgotten his post-it note that had the motto and the dimensions for the sign written on it. And so he texted the pastor, sorry, I forgot by list. Can you tell me again what the motto and the dimensions were? And the senior pastor replied back, unto us a child is born, eight feet long, three feet wide. <laughs> We've talked before about how when God is big, our problems are small. Okay, it's also true that when our love is big, our problems have a way of shrinking. So this morning in our, our Christmas series, uh, the, the first of just a few weeks here, we're going to be emphasizing love, that aspect of Christmas that is God's gift to us. So you've probably noticed that here in 2021, love is pretty difficult, isn't it? Especially if you spend any time on social media. I think part of the problem is that love has, has really been emptied of any meaning. What, what does it even mean? I mean, if you were to ask a random person, what do you love? How would they answer you? I think most people would ask the question, what do you mean? Like, what are you even looking for? And the reason is be, we have so many varied responses is because we, we don't, in our culture, have a universal definition of, of love. It's lost its meaning. It's become one of these, these junk drawer words. You know, you, you all have this drawer in your kitchen like I do, where when you don't know what to do with something, it goes in that drawer, right? That's what love has become in our culture. It's lost its power. And when love loses its power, we lose our awe. So as Christians, we've lost some of the awe that belongs in our hearts in light of the love of God. Christmas is the time to restore our awe in light of God's love. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful to have our hearts and minds joined together this morning to come together as a church family to sing unto you with surrendered hearts, to hear from your word. What a gift it is, God, to, to have your precious word that is so powerful in our lives. God, we pray that your love would be on display, that uh, it would show forth from your word, that your spirit would be driving it deep within our hearts, and that it would show forth from our lives as a result. So God, help us to, to do business with you in the ways that we need to, to have our hearts encouraged and lifted up in the way that those are needed. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 1 John chapter 4 this morning is where we're going to be spending our time. Verses 7 to 11 says this, Beloved, let us love one another. Okay, that's, that's the primary command of the text. Everything else in this passage is, is really contributing material. It's, it's descriptive material of this commandment. It tells us, it demonstrates for us what this universal definition of love is supposed to look like. We have it. Here it is in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. Let us love one another, for love is of God. That's the origin of love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, in that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. He sent us his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What do we know about love from the text? Number one, love is the greatest commandment. Love is the greatest commandment. In verse 7, the, the first part of the, the verse, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. That's the primary command. So think about the person who's hardest for you to love. Maybe for some of us, we have, we have a Rolodex scrolling in our mind. Right? We can all relate to this. I mean, I, how do you do that? How, how do you love impossible people? I mean, 
Jeff, you know how hard it is to, to love hard to love people. It, it is. But the point of the text here is you can love the most impossible person. You can, if you know Christ is your Savior. Here's, here's why. Here's how this works. God uses the proclamation, the very proclamation of, of his word, the, the commandment, love one another. God's word is so powerful that he uses his proclamation to empower the person. That is the way God's word works. That's why it's so important to be in God's word regularly because God passes his power unto, uh, into you through his word. We see another demonstration of this all over scripture, but a great one, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 23. You have been born anew, or you have been born again. How? Through the living and abiding word of God. No other document in history has a divine nature except for the Word of God. So when God's Word is preached to lost people who in and of themselves are totally unable to submit to God, God's Word itself creates within them the, 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 the capacity to submit to God and to believe. And that's why we preach the Gospel. And that's why we do it regularly here at Grace. So 1 John chapter 4, verse, verse 7, let us love one another. That command finds its roots, of course, in the greatest commandment, Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We were made to love God. This is what all human beings were doing created to do. This is the calling for all humanity, to love God. That means that all of us here are lovers. Now, I know that that sounds a little funny, but you are wired to love. Everything that you do in your, in your life, it's always driven and motivated by love. And that love was designed uh, to motivate us to be God-focused, God-oriented, God-directed. That's how we were meant to live. So that when you love someone, you, you want to serve them. You desire to please them. You find joy in their joy. Now, every human being who has ever been given life and breath uh, is designed to love God. But now there are other loves that are constantly clamoring for our hearts. Because no longer do we delight to serve God. No longer do we find joy in his joy. No longer do we want to stay inside of his boundaries. But instead, we, we willingly, purposefully, continually do what's evil in his eyes. What's the greatest command? What's the command of all commands? The root command. It's love God. And that governs all other commands. If love for God is the ultimate command, then the greatest evil of evils is the failure to love God. Because when you don't love God, you will not stay inside of his boundaries. So when human beings no longer love God as they should, it means, it does not mean, that you don't love. Because you always love. You're hardwired to be a lover. So if you're not loving God, then you will give that love to somebody or to something else. No one in this room is loveless. We are all lovers. And God owns your love at the deepest, most profound level, or somebody else or something else does. Then we should ask the question, okay, well then, what love is, is so seductive, so appealing to me, that it actually has the power to replace the love that I was meant to have for God? What love has that power? The Apostle Paul reveals that God replacing love, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. There it is. It begs the question, what are you living for? What you're living for reveals what you love. You are hardwired to be a lover. And we are inclined toward loving ourselves. 
But it's not right. It's, it's backward. We're, see, we're supposed to be living, it says, for, but for him who died for them and rose again. So the thing that, that always replaces love for God, the thing that leads to the endless catalog of, of evil in our lives is this love of self. That somehow, some way, we all insert ourselves into the center of our world. Somehow, some way, we find a way to ascend to his throne so that we're in control, we're at the center, and we don't find delight in serving him because that takes the attention off of us. And we're obsessed with our will and our way. We want to be sovereign over our own lives. We want to set our own rules. We're obsessed with our own comfort, our own pleasure, our own happiness. And when you live for yourself, you will always step over God's boundaries again and again and again. And you will be miserable doing so because your heart isn't motivated by a love for him. What is it that makes marriage so hard? Selfishness. It's self-love. Don't buy this lie that in order to love somebody else well, you have to first love yourself. That's one of the most damning heresies in existence in our day. Why is it that I find it so hard to serve my spouse? So hard to let a, a discussion go without becoming an argument? So hard not to say, oh, told you so. Isn't it that my love for myself that so quickly replaces my love for God? What is it that makes parenting so hard? Children want to write their own law. They want to set their own rules. I, I have never had any one of my boys say to me, Please, Dad, if, if you could just give me more rules, if you could just exercise more authority over my life, then I will live happily ever after. Right? It's, it, it's always just the opposite. We always get this sense that, that you know, uh, that, that our kids are saying, maybe not outwardly, but in our hearts, if, if you would just give me what I want, just let me do what I want to do, they, they really think, then they will live happily ever after. They've convinced themselves of this. Right? You've heard the say, love is blind, right? Yeah, loving yourself sure is. What do we know about love? It's the greatest command. See, with God's love comes the capability to love. So you can obey the command to love others no matter how impossible the person because God uses the power of his proclamation to empower the person. Number two, love is the greatest confirmation. It's the greatest commandment. It's the greatest confirmation, verses seven and eight. The greatest confirmation of whether or not you truly belong to God. Where did love come from? It's a gift from God to his creation. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Love is of God. Look at those, those two phrases there in the text. Is born of God or has been born from God. It's in the perfect tense, uh, meaning that, that their conversion is past tense. It happened in the past. They were saved. They have been made a child of God. And that conversion is now bearing fruit in the present. It says that they know God. Those who, who love him know him. And this is in the present tense, meaning that love is the, the product of an ongoing experiential knowledge of God so that the more and better I know God, the more and better I will love others. So the conclusion is this, that knowing God results in being a more loving person. What do we know from verse 8? A person who knows God will be a more loving person. So verse 8 tells us, that the opposite is also the case. That he who does not love does not know God. In other words, if you do not love, you show you do not even love God. Okay, love is the greatest commandment. It's the greatest confirmation. Number three, love is the greatest revelation. Second part of uh, verse eight says that God is love. This is the greatest revelation ever given to man. See, love is the essence of who he is. All of his activity is loving. If he ever did anything unloving, he would cease to be love. When you genuinely con contemplate the true identity of who God is, you become like him. And this is a, scripture that, uh, a principle that we see in Scripture, that beholding is becoming. 
that as you behold the, the character and the attributes of God and you begin to really know him and experience him in his, his truest form, in his truest character, you cannot help but having your character change and, and come in line with his own. So that when you invest and you work at your relationship with him and you're in his word, you can't help it. You become like him. See, a true apprehension of his personhood leads us to change how we live and behave. So the decline that we see in our society, you all see this, you all feel this, it can be seen in the decline of the knowledge of God. And the decline in the knowledge of God actually results in an increase in the knowledge of wickedness. See, people are becoming increasingly creative and bold in their wickedness. Would you agree? Where is that coming from? See, Jesus talked about this dynamic being true in the last days in Matthew chapter 24 and, and uh, verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And that includes the love of God. Well, love is also, number four, the greatest gift. It's the greatest commandment, confirmation, revelation. It's also the greatest gift. Look in verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son. This is the demonstration of love. This is the illustration. You know, if, if you're in a spelling bee and you ask for the word to be used in a sentence, this, this is it. This gives us the context, the framework for what real, true love looks like. Sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God. But the demonstration is this, that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God's ultimate act of revealing himself to mankind was in sending his son Jesus to the earth. And that's what Christmas is all about. Now let's focus in on this, this big, this word manifested here. Uh, it means to, to show or to reveal. It's a word that refers, refers to the revealing of things that were formerly hidden, things that were left uncovered in the shadows. See, never before in history had God done anything like this. Christ is the unveiling of God's heart. He is God displaying incredible vulnerability to the world. So some of us here, and perhaps even online, think that Christianity and being a Christian is really about following a bunch of rules. That's what I used to think. So I hated church. And you would too. Maybe you do. If you're left thinking, and all your experience has been that, that Christianity is a bunch of rules, and that reveals in the core of our being, we have yet to come to the point where we really know God. See, I thought church, I thought Christianity was for good people, or that it was for old people who were done living their lives in the fast lane. <laughs> what I had to come in to encounter, and what you have to encounter, is that this great and awesome Lord, the creator of the universe, is interested in intimacy with me, that he wants to walk with me, he wants to talk with me. So when we recognize his magnificent, terrifying glory and power, at the same time, we realize his love for us. That's where we discover the good news of the gospel. And that's the message of Christmas, that God became one of us to show his love to us. So you cannot define love by looking horizontally. You cannot define love by looking at humanity. You define love and understand what love truly is by looking at God and the ultimate demonstration of his love, his son, Jesus. Think about someone that you deeply love. Have you ever hurt them? Intentionally or, or unintentionally? Have you ever had conflict with them? So you see what I mean here? Even your best relationships cannot be used to define love. They fall short. So let's just say that you could find a, a man, woman, or a child who is never going to give you up, never going to let you down, never going to run around or desert you, never going to make you cry, never going to say goodbye, never going to tell a lie and hurt you. Right? Maybe, maybe in the fantasy land, fantasy land of 80s music. See, 
You never thought that you'd get rickrolled at Grace Baptist Church, right? I don't even know if that's still a thing. Probably not. Sometimes even with good intentions, we harm other people. Why? Because our existence is tainted by sin. See, you can have the best of intentions in your relationships, but that does not always, your intentions do not determine impact. And there we see the effect of sin upon our, our love. It's what makes us long for love in its purest form. It's what motivates us and draws us to look for it in all the wrong places. That's why we have to look to God for our definition of love. So we let him give us the picture of love and we let him color it in for us. How is love made visible? How do we define love? We see perfect, untainted by sin, God. Come down from heaven, put on flesh, come as a baby to grow into a man who would seek and to save the lost. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world from condemnation. To save you from God's wrath. And here's where our brains might hurt. Okay, it's over this big word that you noticed in the text that you probably have no idea what it means there in verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation doesn't make any sense to us, most of us, because it doesn't make any sense. We have no framework for it in our cultural definition, junk drawer term of love. What happened here, and what God is saying, is that he made love so visible, so extraordinary, that he actually appeased the wrath of God the Father. That's the very definition of propitiation, a theological term that means it, it's the act of removing an offense against someone through an act of sacrifice. It is, it's satisfying God's wrath. This is what repairs our broken relationship with God. Uh, he sacrificed his life to remove your offense. He became the target of God's wrath so that he could heal your broken relationship with God. That's love. As, as Pastor Shirk says, it's our good at his cost. Jesus did that. That's the gift of propitiation. In our day, though, our hollow understanding of love is I get to do what I want to do, and you're not allowed to disagree with me. So some kind of, of external force or authority that would tell me how or, or how I, I can or cannot love, that's absolutely tyrannical to me. And that's where you get code phrases like, love is love. W what does that even mean? It's a junk drawer. An undefined word is an undefined word. It, it's, it's a code with an agenda behind it. It's just like people throwing around what they really think is great theology by just, by just chanting and waving the banner of, of God is love under the umbrella of all kinds of atrocities. Because the conclusion there by some people is that there is no wrath in God because he is love. They see no wrath in God being love because they do not understand love. They're looking at it from the junk drawer. You cannot separate love and wrath. Theologian uh, Miroslav Volf, he identified, um, the way he articulates this is, is really good. He sees wrath and God's love as, as two sides of the same coin. See, it's because God is loving that he must be wrathful. And his wrath is the product of his love. So here's what he said. He said, I used to think that wrath was actually unworthy of God because isn't God love? So shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love. God loves every person and every creature. Right, but that's exactly why God is wrathful against some. He said, My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Of course he is. Or think of Rwanda in the past decade uh, of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. 
How did God react to that carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandfatherly fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness? No. Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? See, though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to actually rebel against a God who was not wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God is not wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because he is love. So God made a way that you would not have to be the object of his wrath because he loves you. By placing your faith in Jesus Christ to save you and to forgive you from your sin. See, when you do that, because Jesus paid the price for your sin on the cross, he stood in your place to bear God's wrath so that God could look upon you with love and gracie, grace and mercy and have your sins forgiven so that you could become spotless, completely clean, innocent. So, when at Christmas time we look back on the baby in the manger who created the universe, we're intended to be struck with awe, to be blown away. We should be humbled. Because here we were, dead in our trespasses and sins, the enemies of God, the targets of God's wrath. And yet here is a baby in a manger who has come to save us from the wrath of God, to be the propitiation of our sin. That's the advent or the coming of love. If you want to see love, you look at Jesus. Fifth and finally, love is the greatest testimony. Love is the greatest testimony. We see this in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this begs a, a key question here. When the world looks at the church, and let's think specifically about Grace Baptist Church, does the world see a love that can only be explained by the supernatural work of God? Is that what people see? See, that is the key question for the existence of our church. There must be such a love if this text is going to make any sense. Because verse 7 says that he who loves is born of God and knows God. So if we are a truly God-knowing people, then we will be a God-loving, people-loving people. Jesus said it um, this way in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, about our testimonies. He said, let your, love so, let, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. I long to love like that. And I, I love seeing our church in action loving like that. There's nothing more thrilling in life than, than experiencing the love of God so deeply that it spills out over into our relationships. And that's what Christmas is all about, being so deeply transformed by the love of God inwardly that we live the supernatural love of God outwardly. But can we say that we love God if we are at odds with his mission of loving others? Or we're just neglectful or passive? If we don't pour out our, love, our, our lives to lovingly reach others with the gospel? Because if Jesus died to save his enemies, can we say with any integrity that we love him and yet refuse to join him in his mission? It can't be. So there are times when my thoughts and your thoughts are shaped by the love of God, but not always. There are times when the things that I desire flow out of a love for God, but not always. There are times when the words that you speak are, are formed, the, the, the content of those, those words, the, the tone of those words are formed by a love for God, but not always. 
There are times when you act in ways that you wouldn't otherwise act if it weren't for your love for God, but not always. See, you gave empirical evidence this week that the war of love still rages within your heart. And that brought evil and chaos into the place where you live, even this week. Maybe that struggle was even experienced this morning as you were preparing to come to a worship service. How ironic, right? But maybe the love that we're talking about is a familiar love to you. Maybe you've placed your, your love, you've placed your trust in this Jesus. But you'd have to say this morning, you know what, you're right, man, I still see that war raging within my heart and, and life, and I still need the resources that only Jesus Christ makes available to me. We want to be able to help you this Christmas season. Um, one of the tools that you can take advantage of that you'll find in various places out in the foyer is this devotional, Celebrating Jesus, 10 Christmas Reflections. I, I don't know what your plan is for growing spiritually or helping your family to grow spiritually in their love for God and love for others this Christmas season, but this might be a great next step for you. Maybe you're there and you're ready to put your testimony to work. We have another opportunity for, for you. Uh, out in the, the foyer, you noticed the Christmas tree when you came in. Some of you already took advantage of this. We are doing our, our angel tree project this year. Uh, we're partnering with the Salvation Army to be able to provide um, children who have been screened, families who have been qualified to receive these gifts. And you'll, you'll notice if you take a tag, there's a description on the back of, of what they're looking for. You can provide Christmas for a child and help a family in need. You can bring those back by December 19th right here to the church keep them in a bag with the tag and we will get those to um, the people who need them most. But what a, what a great testimony. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. But maybe you're here this morning and for the first time you say, you know what? I don't know that I have ever done anything for anyone but me. So if, that, if that's the case, I would plead with you to turn to Jesus Christ, to ask him to forgive you of your sin, to surrender your life to him so that you can experience God in all of his fullness and understand what it's like to truly love God, to experience a love that's so far beyond, so much deeper, so much more satisfying, so much more fulfilling than a shallow, destructive love for yourself. See, he sent the son of his love, Jesus Christ, down to earth in the form of a baby to live a perfect life so that he could be the sacrifice of our sin, to pay a debt that we could never pay, to take upon himself God's wrath so that we would no longer have to be the target, we no longer have to be the enemy of God. You can become the friend of God. You can become his child today if you just trust Jesus Christ as your savior. And if you need help doing that, we would love to be able to help you. You can talk to any one of us pastors. You can talk to the person who invited you. You can call the church this week or send a message. Get on social media. You can direct message us. Any way that you're comfortable doing it, we would love to be. This is what we are all about. This is our mission as Grace Baptist Church. To see more and better followers of Jesus Christ made so that more people can experience his love and show his love to others. So at this time, we're going to take some time to reflect on the greatest gift as we celebrate communion together, to be able to, to reflect on that greatest gift, Jesus coming to earth to be the propitiation for our sins, to offer us forgiveness. So if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've experienced the love of God that we talked about this morning, then these next moments are for you. For you to, when, when the worship team begins playing, you can go to any of the four stations in the corner of the room and, and take uh, one of those little cups. You'll notice that there is a thin film on the top. You unpeel that thin film from the thicker film, and in between the films is that little white piece of bread. And uh, we'll give you instructions at, at that point when, when we're ready, but just bring it back to your seat and hold on to it. Then underneath the thicker piece of film is, is the juice. 
So we're going to take a, a moment of, of silence as the worship team plays. They're going to be um, playing a song called O Come All Ye Unfaithful. Super appropriate for our time this morning because that's who we are. We all fall short in our love for God and our love for others. And yet what we find over and over again is forgiveness and grace. And so we want to come to him in complete surrender, reflecting on the sacrifice that he made for us, the fact that he was our propitiation. And so we remember the fact that he stood in our place to bear God's wrath so that we would no longer have to be the target of his wrath. You might also notice on the tables, um, here is another opportunity for you to be able to give out of a heart for the Lord and a love for others. Um, there are baskets there. That's for our deacon offering. Uh, we use those funds to be able to help families in need. Super important, especially at Christmas time. All right, please join me in, in prayer before we turn it over to the worship team. Father, we're thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be able to come together as a church family and to meditate on your character. Because as we behold you for who you truly are, lo and behold, we become more like you. So God, draw us into the, to those, those loving realities, those spiritual laws that govern our universe that are so real and so true that if only we would get on board with them, they would absolutely revolutionize our lives. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for our sins, to bear your wrath so that we wouldn't have to. Thank you that he took the hell that we deserved so that we could have your heaven. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
So when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I just want to thank you as a church family for how you consistently demonstrate the love of God to others. Uh, you know, occasionally the, the testimonies that we get to hear as pastors, uh, when we meet people in the community and they find out that um, we're one of the pastors at Grace Baptist Church, and to hear, oh, I know so-and-so, and they'll go on about how you know, great and, and loving that person is. Um, that absolutely thrills our souls to be able to hear that. So I'm so grateful to be, and I know the other pastors are as well, to be a part of a, a loving church family. And uh, we have a mission to do together. To be serious about loving God and, and loving others. And um, I couldn't be more thankful to be able to do that with, with you all. So don't forget, we have lots of opportunities this Christmas season to take it up a notch. We've got devotionals, uh, a couple different devotionals out in the foyer. You can um, avail yourself of those. We've got the angel tree opportunities out there, and of course, there's the deacon fund baskets at, at each of the corners. Please join me in prayer. Father, we're tremendously thankful for the love that you poured out for us in, in unscribed. Our, our brains blow a fuse trying to apprehend the reality of you sending your only son to die for us. That is a demonstration of love that we just can't get our brains around. And that defines love for us. That really, uh, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And that is, that's the definition. So Father, we want to love you in return because you first loved us. So God, would you using your proclamation as we meditate on it, would you empower your people to love others better? In Jesus' name, amen. You're not dismissed, you are sent. Mm -hmm.